Good morning. Good morning. First reading today is from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 7. It's found on page 724 of your Pew Bible and 1474 of the large print. <clears throat> Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword, in the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow, in his quiver he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity, yet surely my right is with the Lord, and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is found on page 553, or 1135 of the large print Bible. Psalm 40, verses 1 through 11. Please read responsibly. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me out from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us, None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an opening ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight in your will. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, found on page 1,131 or 2,289 of the large print Bible. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. 
that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel. The Holy Gospel is found in the book of John, chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 29 through 42, and that's on page 1053 of your pew Bible. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them, the following, and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let's open this morning in prayer. God of all creation, thank you for this new day. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. You have made each of us, and you know us intimately. You know our quirks, our foibles, our sins. You know us deeper than we know ourselves. And yet you have called us to be your children. Thank you, Lord. This morning we ask that you give us hearts and minds to hear your Holy Spirit. Give us ears to hear, hearts to know Jesus. May the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, our Lord and our rock. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the scriptures Jesus asks two especially important questions, thought-provoking questions. One is found in this morning's reading from the book of John, verse 37. What are you seeking? The other is found in Matthew 16, verse 15. But who do you say I am? Which question is more important? first question is asked very early in Jesus' ministry, right after his baptism, in fact, while the second is asked much later, after the disciples had been following Jesus for a period of time. The first question is asked of two men who would begin to follow Jesus, while the second is asked to the disciples, leading Peter to ask his famous confession, or give his famous confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
first question could really be applicable to life in general, couldn't it? While the second question is more applicable to saving faith. Both questions are significant and really should be answered by every follower of Jesus. Our reading from John this morning leads us to focus on this first question, one asked of two of John's the Baptist disciples as they ponder following Jesus. What are you seeking? The crowds that followed John the Baptist were certainly seeking something. By, by this time of John's message, one calling for repentance and baptism, but they had resulted in a large following. We read in Matthew chapter 3, verse 5, and then Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region about Jordan were coming out to see him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. It's quite a few people, isn't it? John, the name of John was the buzz about town. He had disciples devoted to following him, hanging on to his every word. John's message had struck a nerve. This message even caused many Pharisees and, and Sadducees to come to be baptized by John. And it's likely that hundreds and maybe even thousands had heard his preaching and had confessed their sins. John, the baptizer, was accomplishing his mission. People eager for the coming of the Messiah were flocking to the wilderness to hear John's message. And some were even wondering if maybe, just maybe, John the Baptist was himself the Messiah. Our reading from John this morning takes place in the days following Jesus' own baptism. John and his disciples see Jesus approaching and John ends all question of his being by the Messiah, he announces, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in these words, John is confirming that Jesus is the Christ, giving compelling evidence as to why his own disciples should be following Jesus instead. He explains that his mission had been to reveal the Messiah, explaining that, but for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he, Jesus, might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Now John did not know for sure that his younger cousin Jesus was the Messiah, that is, until he saw the Holy Spirit descend in the form of a dove upon Jesus during his baptism. Jesus was much greater than John the Baptist because he was, that he existed before John. But now, following Jesus' baptism, John does what he had been called to do. He announces to him, he announces him to the people of Israel, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And with these words, John has accomplished his mission. And now it was time for Jesus' ministry to increase. And it was time for John the Baptist's ministry to decrease. Two of John's disciples now leave him to follow the Lamb of God. And we know for sure that one of these was the Apostle Andrew, because he's the only one named in the scripture. But it's highly likely that the second disciple was the Apostle John, who also heard the Baptist's announcement and is the only gospel writer to record it in this gospel. Faithful Jews had been seeking the Messiah for eons. The Messiah they were seeking was one who would bring them freedom from the Roman aggressors who ruthlessly ruled over their nation. They were seeking a Messiah who was going to restore the city of Jerusalem back to its status as the center of Jewish worship and power. 
And they were also seeking a Messiah who was going to heal the sickness in their land, as prophesied in Isaiah 35. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped, and then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute shall sing for joy. To be afflicted with these or many other physical ailments was seen as a sign of God's judgment against the people for their sins. The people of Israel were seeking the Messiah, but the question is this, did they really know what kind of a Messiah they should be looking for? Which leads us to Jesus' insightful question this morning to the disciples and to us. What are you seeking? The reality is this, all of humanity is seeking something. They just do not know what it is that they're looking for. And since most people do not know what it is they're really seeking, their inclination is to fall back on what the world tells them. will bring them hope, the hope that they're seeking. And so they fall back on their, their, their best, worst guess on finding meaning that what they're, to what they're seeking. First, they're seeking power. They will say, with power, I can have anything that I want. And they will spend their time trying to climb the corporate ladder. They will seek power in the political realm. They even seek power in the church. They long to exert power and authority over others, finding meaning through control. Another thing they seek is wealth. They have the belief that money can buy me most anything I want. Money can assure me that I have the best house, the best car, the biggest boat. I can send my kids to the best school. With money, I can even exert power over others. You know, so things kind of tie together here. With enough money, I will never have to worry about anything ever again. Many will seek knowledge, deceive themselves by saying, I'm not seeking knowledge for knowledge's sake, but knowledge impresses others. It controls others. And knowledge will give me the ability to solve all of the world's problems and my own. And finally, many seek popularity. They acknowledge, I like people to like me. And truth be told, I like what certain people can give me if they like me. They want to be liked by the right people for what they can get out of the relationship. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the reality is that each of these things, placing our hope and our trust in them, like things like power, wealth, knowledge, and popularity, leads to a form of living death. Without knowing it, what most people are actually seeking is deliverance from sin, deliverance from these things, and all of its adverse effects on our lives. And in this world, in seeking a sense of identity, sin confuses us as to our relationship with others and where we fit into this big picture called life. We begin to picture ourselves as the center of the world, no, the center of the universe, Everything revolves around us. And we see that all of our relationships are somehow about me. Do you remember those marketing companies where you sell cleaning products to, or cleaning products or knives or vitamins to everyone you know or everyone you might have cast your shadow upon somewhere in the past? My bride has had some experience in a couple of these, and these businesses are built on the premise of building relationships with others. Why? So you can sell them something. In their, in their training, retail partners are instructed to focus on building relationships with others, to get close to them, show interest in their lives, which is until you determine that that relationship is not going to result in a sale. And then you do away with that relationship and make yourself available to others to build a relationship. You know, the, the sad part is this is true in some churches 
where members are told to build re relationships outside the, ch uh, the, the church to try to recruit <coughs> disciples. And once you determine that that person will not be a disciple, you dismiss that relationship and go find one that will result in a disciple. In seeking a sense of security, sin means that we, we are going to get sick. It means I am going to lose my vitality, and perhaps I might even lose that beloved nest egg that we spent a left, lifetime building. For many people in this world, a diagnosis of some debilitating disease changes their life, as they have to now make a choice between financial security and taking a chance on giving up that financial security in search of a cure. The reality is that finally we, we're going to die at some point. It's the universal nature of man. The constant seeking of meaning and purpose and endless focus on this life itself produces a sense of meaninglessness, hopelessness. Since I'm not going, since I am going to die anyway, how can I really come? How can anything really come of what I do? What we are really seeking, God provides for us in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God calls us to repent of all those best worst guesses, which are really nothing but false gods. Power. It fades. Wealth, it evaporates, or we leave it for somebody else. Knowledge, well, sometimes it can make us fools. Popularity is fleeing at best. Just look at someone who makes one wrong comment on social media right now and find out how quickly their role as an influencer, what is that, by the way, <laughs> is pulled from them as they suddenly find themselves vilified. In realizing each of these as the false gods that they are, we find that what we really seek is one who can take all these sins away from us, away from the world. If we're clear on what we see, are seeking, then we will see that these two disciples in our reading today are actually headed in the right direction. As these disciples are seeking, Jesus says, come, come and you will see. Jesus is the anointed one of God who takes away that sin which separates us from God the Father. He brings us back into fellowship with God. A fellowship that was the way we were designed for it from the very beginning. Through Jesus' sinless life, through his passion, that, that would be his suffering at the hands of Pontius Pilate, and through his death on the Roman's cross, and through his resurrection from the grave, Jesus, first of all, restores our identity as redeemed children of God. And through Christ you will find that the sins that once alienated you from God and others are forgiven. And you will know with certainty that you belong to Jesus, which is also means that you belong to others who are his as well. In Galatians 3.26 we read, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. Next, Jesus restores our security, our sense of security. Having reconciled you to himself by removing your sin, God holds you security, securely while you live and when you die. Whatever else might be uncertain in this life, this is a surety. Galatians 3, 27 and 28 tells us, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and no female. For you are all in one in Christ Jesus. What assurance. And finally, Jesus restores our source of meaning and purpose. Since now death is not the end for us, your labors for God's kingdom now have a, a lasting and an eternal value. For if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, according to God's promise. 
Like Andrew, we can now go and tell others of the Lamb of God. Our lives become living witnesses to what Christ has done for us. How he has brought us forgiveness of sin. How he has brought us salvation. And how we are now heirs of eternal life. It's ours already. That's a purpose. That, brothers and sisters, has eternal value. In deliverance from all the effects of sin, what are we seeking? If it is that, then if it is, I'm sorry, I messed myself up there. Is deliverance from all the effects of sin what we're seeking? If it is, then that second question has become what we need to answer next. We need the one who takes away the, our sin, the sin that causes this world and every, everyone in it so much suffering. But see, John has already answered that question for us in our text today. Who do you say that I am? Jesus will, that's the question he will ask his disciples later, and John has answered, Jesus is the Lamb of God who does exactly what we need, takes away the sin of the world. In Jesus' name. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen.